Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla. I am back with Ralph S. Mouse. And this is by Beverly Cleary, one of my favorite children's authors. We are on Chapter 4, Life at School. Dusk began to fall in Room 5, making the inside of Melissa's boot even darker, when suddenly Ralph heard music. The lights were turned on, and a man with a transistor radio fastened to his belt came into the room and lifted chairs onto tables. He began to sweep with a wide broom while the radio poured forth sad songs about lonely highways, broken hearts, and jail. The songs made Ralph feel gloomy as well as sulky. He began to feel sorry for himself. The long haul, so perfect for motorcycle riding, was dark and empty. His heart was broken over the loss of his motorcycle, and he might as well be in jail as in this old boot. When the man swept his way to the back of the room, he unexpectedly set Melissa's boots upright side by side, tumbling Ralph down to the foot where he sat trembling with nerves and self-pity until his ears told him the man had replaced the chairs on the floor turned off the lights and left. Because he was a mouse, Ralph found sleeping at night almost impossible. Without the grandfather clock to mark the hours, the night seemed endless. Why should I sit here in this smelly old jail of a boot when everyone is so mean to me? Ralph asked himself. And with the cruelty of the world as an excuse for breaking his promise to Ryan, he used his sharp claws to climb the boot lining. Quickly, he leaped out and squeezed under the door of room five. Nobody was going to stop him from exploring Irwin J. Sneed Elementary School. After a long and wistful look at the lonely highway of the hall, Ralph found exploration more interesting and profitable than he had expected. In room four, he discovered strange-looking pictures spread out on the floor beneath the blackboard. They were made of gluing different kinds of, by gluing different kinds of seeds to heavy paper and had been left on the floor to dry. Ralph made a nutritious meal of split peas rice and lentils before moving on to another room where he found an open jar of library paste. Delicious! Another room furnished with long tables and benches was near a kitchen where Ralph chewed into a bag of sugar and enjoyed a fine dessert. After this gourmet meal, Ralph walked rather than scampered down the hall, that perfect place for riding his motorcycle if Ryan had not been so mean, to a room with a carpet and bookshelves along the walls. A boring place for a mouse, Ralph decided until he discovered something interesting on the bottom shelf behind a desk. It turned out to be a book inside a bag made of two layers of brown paper. A tear in the outer layer, layer revealed something unexpected in the lining. Ralph could not believe the treasure he had found. Between the layers of paper was ready chewed mouse nest. Ralph pulled out some of the nest to examine its delicate texture. First quality grade, a mouse nest. He made the hole in the bag still larger crawled inside and curled up in the coziest bed he had ever known. Ralph intended to rest there while he plotted to get his motorcycle away from Ryan. But his full meal made him drowsy and instead he fell asleep. Awaking to the sound of school buses, he ran back to room five just in time as his former friend was hanging up his parka. Ralph ran up the leg of Ryan's jeans and onto his shirt. You give me my motorcycle, he demanded, trying to sound fierce. Ryan quickly faced the corner so no one could see Ralph. Be quiet. You're not supposed to be here, he whispered. Like I said, I'll give it to you after you run the maze. Who says I'm going to run it? Ralph was sullen about this whole affair. I do. Ryan tried to, squeak, to speak without moving his lips. If you want your motorcycle back. Where is it? Ralph wanted to know. 
right here. Ryan removed the motorcycle from his parka and placed it in one of his shirt pockets. Now, go back to your boot. Don't call it my boot, said Ralph. It's dusty and smelly. Will you be quiet if I let you stay in my pocket? Sure. A shirt was warm and soft and had a good view of the classroom, if a hole was nipped in the pocket. As he dropped Ralph into his pocket, Ryan said, And another thing, don't chew any more no holes in my pockets. Mom didn't like it when she saw holes in the new shirt I wore yesterday. We'll see about that, thought Ralph, determined not to let lub-dub of Ryan's heart lull him to sleep again until he figured out how to get that motorcycle back. For a better view of room five, he bit a careful peephole, one thread down and one thread across in Ryan's pocket. Ralph watched with puzzled interest while the class worked with numbers and words. Late in the morning, the children formed a double line, something Ralph had never before witnessed, and walked quietly to the library where they selected books to read. Why can't mice behave like that, Ralph wondered. When Ryan had found the book he wanted, he took the little red motorcycle out of his pocket and amused himself by running it back and forth across the table while softly going <laughs> The sound was enough to break a mouse's heart. The most interesting part of the day turned out to be late in the afternoon when the class worked on their projects for what the children called the Great Mouse Exhibit. Miss Kay read a poem that Ralph found difficult to understand, something about wee sleek kit cowering tumorous beastie while the class worked with crayons and paper. Ralph saw strange pictures of himself beginning to emerge. They were making him look very big, except for one boy who drew a cat that filled up the whole paper and then added a tiny mouse down in the corner. Other boys and girls bent over their paper, writing, pausing to gnaw their pencils, writing again. Others behaved strangely, nodding their heads, tapping their pencils, and softly chanting, Ta-dum, ta-tum, 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 or ta-ta-dum, ta-ta-dum. The noises sounded something like an Indian war dance in an old movie on TV, thought Ralph, puzzled. Ryan and Brad worked with glue and some old cartons on the table at the back of the room. They moved around so much, and Ralph's peephole was so small that he could not get a very clear idea of what they were building. Apparently, they did not have a very clear idea themselves, for they argued about the way to make the partitions of the maze stand up about the height of the partitions. We don't want him to be able to see over them, even if he stands on his hind legs, and the length and the number of the blind alleys. Of the blind alleys. Mostly, they argued about the difficulty of the maze. Let's make it really hard, said Brad. Ralph decided he did not like Brad with his tousled hair, grubby t-shirt, and unfriendly ways. Not too hard, said Ryan. Ah, oh, come on, said Brad. Making tunnels and trap doors would be fun. Real mazes aren't like that, and it wouldn't be fair, protested Ryan. He's just a little mouse. Besides, we haven't figured out how to make the partition stand up. You're scared he can't do it, said Brad. Of course, he can do it. Ryan was a at least loyal. But what if I can't do it, Ralph worried. What if I run around bumping my nose instead of against dead ends? Then how would Ryan feel after all his bragging? A terrible thought occurred to Ralph. If he failed and everyone laughed, Ryan might not give us motorcycle after all. Ralph decided there was only one thing to do. Get up on that table at night and practice. He would memorize the maze so that he could dash through the passages without bumping his nose even once. Ralph had no longer made this decision. Then part of the maze must have fallen down, for Ryan said, See, I told you it wouldn't work that way. Brad lost patience. All right, he said. Since you're so smart, you can make your own dumb maze for your own dumb mouse. I'll write a poem instead. You don't like to write poems, Ryan reminded him. I'd rather write a poem than work on your dumb maze for your dumb mouse, answered Brad. His name should be Ralph D. Mouse, 
D for dumb. Okay, said Ryan, suit yourself. But I don't see why you have to be so touchy all the time. Good, thought Ralph. Ryan will make it easy. When the last bell rang, Ryan asked permission to work on the maze at home because he still hadn't figured out how to make the partition stand up. Of course, you may, Miss Kay told him, thereby destroying Ralph's plan to practice. I hoped you and Brad might become friends if you worked together. She raised her voice above the scramble for jackets and caps. Class, I have a surprise, she announced. Someone who writes stories for the Kukaraka voice heard about our mouse exhibit and wants to write it up for the paper. She is going to come Friday afternoon and bring a photographer. Kukaraka, although it had grown since Gold Rush days, was still a small town. News traveled fast. There was a buzz of excitement. Room 5 was going to have its picture in the newspaper. When Ryan plucked Ralph from his pocket, Ralph asked in his tiniest voice, Do I get a chance to practice running through that thing before Friday? That would be cheating, said Ryan through his stiff lips, the same as looking at test questions before the test. Just one little peek, coaxed Ralph. Nope. Ryan poked Ralph into Melissa's boot and ran off to catch the bus. Ralph crawled down around the bend to the toe of the boot where he sat brooding in the dusty, musky dark. For the first time since he had left the inn, he began to wonder if anyone missed him in his old home. And that is the end of chapter four. Let's look at the pictures. Okay, so here is a picture of Ralph getting into the jar of paste in the library. Oh my goodness, and he ate it. Ooh, and he thought it was awesome. I guess mice have a different taste than we do. And that was the only picture in that chapter. So we'll have to get to chapter five next time. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.